welcome to this video on third harmonic generation and also cross phase modulation. In a previous video, which I'm going to be referring to extensively in this one, so feel free to check it out up here, I derived this master equation, which explains how the spectrum of an electric field changes as it propagates through a medium with a so-called chi-3 nonlinearity. The solution approach was to express the spectrum as an infinite sum of discrete frequency components. The evolution of these frequency components were then modeled individually, which allowed us to simply add them together at the very end to get the total spectrum evolution. In that previous video, I used a simplified expression for the cube of the electric field on the right-hand side of this master equation. Essentially, it was assumed that the cube of the E-field is dominated by just a single frequency component, and that allowed us to generate a very simple model for third harmonic generation, in which power could be transferred from omega-1 into omega-3, but not in the backwards direction. So in this video, we're going to use a more advanced model, which contains two frequency terms inside of this E-cubed expansion. And I guess we can call this the two-wave mixing approximation. So to compute the cube of the E-field, we have to compute the cube of this bracket right here, which contains the part oscillating as omega a, the part oscillating as omega b, and then their respective complex conjugates. So to make the algebra a bit simpler, I've simply decided to express this term here as a, and this term here as b, and then of course including the respective complex conjugates right here. So to compute this cube, I think it's easiest to start by just computing the square of this parenthesis, including four terms. So to do that, and just to keep things a bit more manageable, I decided to do this in terms of a little table right here where you can see every single cross term has been multiplied together. And then the sum of this parenthesis will just be the addition of all the different terms that arise inside of this table. And so if you multiply, for example, a onto that table, we get this one. If we multiply a conjugate onto it, we get this one, and so on and so forth for b and b conjugate. And then, of course, if we add together all the terms that arise inside of these four tables, we're going to get the cube of the bracket right here, and then we can multiply by 1 over 8 to get the cube of the E field. So if we go through all of that tedious algebra, we basically get this expression right here for the cube of the electric field if we collect all the terms that behave the same way. So let's try and understand what every one of these terms actually do. If we include this term here on the right-hand side of the master equation, essentially it will be responsible for applying third harmonic generation to the frequency of omega b. In other words, if we include this term, we can see that the frequency at 3 omega p is going to be amplified as we move move forward. Now, this term over here is interesting because it basically implies that we're upshifting the frequency of omega a by 2 omega b, causing this frequency to be generated on the right-hand side of the master equation. This one, on the other hand, basically corresponds to starting at omega b and then downshifting by 2 omega a, which you can see by the little complex conjugate here. In general, that's a good rule of thumb to have when analyzing these terms. If two terms that are not conjugated are multiplied together, it corresponds to upshifting the frequency. But if a conjugation term is multiplied on here, we can see that it corresponds to downshifting the frequency. So one thing you might be wondering when you see this very complicated expression here is, do we need to include all of these terms when we plug it into the master equation? Unfortunately, the answer is no, we don't have to include all of these. The underlying reason for that is essentially phase matching, which again I explained very extensively in the, the previous video. So the way to understand phase matching is that if you have a nonlinear medium, then the, you can think of that as being made up of a very large number of very small antennae, which have the property that they emit light in a way that depends on the cube of the local E field. So the idea is that if you have one frequency omega-1 here marked in red that's propagating through the medium, it's going to excite these little antenna, which is then going to emit light at three times that frequency, for example, in blue here. Now, if you want the blue wave to have a very large amplitude at the very end of the medium, you have to make sure that the wave that propagates through the medium has the same spatial frequency, or rather a spatial frequency that's very well matched with the spatial frequency of these little antennae here. Essentially, this is just due to uh, construct interference. If you want maximum power out here, you want maximum constructive interference between the wave that's already present and the antenna that are present out here. But you can see that in this case, there's not a really perfect match between the spatial frequency of the antenna that are riding on top of the red omega-1 wave and the blue wave right here. You can see in the beginning they're sort of well-matched, but then as you go forward they sort of start to, to drift apart. So in this case you won't get a perfect build-up of power in the third wave right here. So in general, mathematically, what we want is that if we have some kind of frequency on the left-hand side of the master equation, we have to make sure that its spatial frequency matches up with one of the terms that we saw on the right-hand side of the expansion for, for E cubed. For example, just to make things a bit more clear, if we have the master equation here just for the E3 field component, we can see that the condition is that the spatial frequency of that wave, like so, matches up with three times the spatial frequency of the 
sort of source wave right here. And if that's the case, we get a strong buildup. But if they're a little bit different, the buildup will not be quite as large. And if they're very different, it will actually be quite minimal. Now, the point is that because we as the experimentalists are the one choosing the nonlinear medium, and we're also the ones choosing what frequencies we're launching in, we can actually ensure beforehand that particular terms in that EQB expansion will be negligible. And again, the reason here is just that the spatial frequency of any wave depends on the refractive index of the material as well as the wave that you're launching in its frequency. And again, we're the ones choosing that. So we can decide in advance which terms in the EQB expansion will drop out because they're not phase matched. So for example, if we take this um, simple example here where we assume that only the terms containing A or B directly will survive, well, then we just have to make sure that the A cube term here will satisfy this condition, that the spatial frequency at 3 omega A is different from the spatial frequency at omega A times 3. And of course, same thing for the B term right here. And for this one, we have to ensure that the spatial frequency at omega A plus 2 omega B is different from the spatial frequency at omega A plus 2 um, times the spatial frequency at omega B, and so on and so forth for the other terms. Now, in the way I've explained it right here, it kind of sounds as if it's very difficult to make sure that these terms cancel out. But in reality, it's way, way harder to make sure that any of them survive because there's so many things that have to add up in uh, sort of a convenient way for these conditions to be, be satisfied. So if you just pick a random medium and pick some random frequencies, it's very unlikely that any of these terms will survive. So you actually have to engineer things to make them survive. But anyway, I think you get the point that we can actually terminate some of these terms here just because the spatial frequency doesn't, doesn't line up. So anyway, if we cancel out all of those terms, we're left with this expression here for the cube of the E field. And then if we compute the Fourier transform, every single instance of A will contain a complex exponential that is oscillating at omega A. So taking the Fourier transform of a complex exponential just gives us a delta function. And then same thing for the B factor over here. Now, if we just look at the A component, we can see that the expression reduces to this. And plug that into the master equation, we can solve it using some of the tricks that we saw in the previous video. First of all, we can express this with the uh, complex conjugates, but we can also drop those because when we solve for the evolution of EA correctly, then we can always conjugate it to get the complex conjugate back, add it on, then get the, the real field component. So we don't really have to worry about this conjugation term right here. Anyway, we can then assume that the double gradient right here can be expressed only in terms of the set gradient. In other words, we're assuming that whatever field we're launching in, it doesn't change very much in the transverse xy direction, but it can change quite a lot in the forward set direction. Furthermore, we can assume that the second derivative of EA is very small compared to the first derivative, which basically allows us to turn this uh, second order differential equation into a first order one. Now, if we simply take this and just rearrange it a little bit, we get this differential equation here that explains how the EA field evolves as we propagate forward in the set direction. Now, we can note that this basically can be solved using a complex exponential in the following way, where this is just the initial value of that field component, and then it evolves with a phase shift that depends both on the distance traveled but also on the absolute square of these two fields. So you might notice that this term here is basically the self-phase modulation term that we saw in the previous video, but we also get this other term here, which seems to depend on the other field that we're launching in. So to make things a bit simpler, let's assume that the EA field component is very, very small compared to the EB component. That allows us to write the EA component's evolution in the following way, which just depends on the absolute square of EB, or you can think about this as the average power of the EB field. Now, if we substitute that into the equation for the uh, field component at omega a, or at least the real part of it, we can see that this exponential here basically behaves the same way as an addition to the spatial frequency like so. And so essentially we get a, a boost to the spatial frequency because we have an, a large absolute square of the EB field here. Okay, so let's try and understand visually what's going on. Essentially, if we launch a low power EA wave into this medium, it's going to have some spatial frequency beta a. But if you also send in another wave with a very high, um, with a different frequency and also very high power, we can see that that changes the spatial frequency of the first field. So again, this is without that second field and with it and without and with and without and with. So you can see that the spatial frequency gets boosted by the presence of a very strong additional field here at a different frequency. And this is the effect known as cross phase modulation because the power of this field is sort of so strong that it goes across and changes the spatial frequency of another field. And of course, this actually goes in both directions. If you solve this equation both for the uh, EA component and the EB component, you can see that they both depend on each other's power in this way. But there is one thing that's a bit mysterious to me, and which I haven't really found a good intuitive explanation for. Essentially, it is that the cross-phase modulation term seems to be twice as strong as the self-phase modulation term. So you can see that in this equation right here, EB sort of is twice as strong as the EA part. And in this one, the EA part is twice as strong as the EB part. And it's still a bit mysterious to me because 
with everything I just explained about phase matching, you would expect that it's very easy for any field to affect itself, because after all they have the same frequency, same spatial frequency and everything else, but it seems like the um, the presence of other fields in a nonlinear medium is more significant than the presence of the field itself, and again, I don't understand visually why that's the case. Sort of mathematically it's very obvious, because if you look at our tables from before, we can just remove all the terms that don't contain self-phase modulation or cross-phase modulation, then remove all the B terms just to focus on the A ones, and remove all the conjugation terms, and now it's very obvious that we get three terms right here that describe self-phase modulation, but six terms that describe cross-phase modulation. So again, mathematically, in terms of combinatorics or algebra, it's very easy to see that cross-phase modulation must be twice as strong as self-phase modulation, at least when the fields are co-polarized. But again, I don't really understand visually or intuitively on a physical level why this is the case. So if you have any ideas, I'd love to hear them in the comments or maybe even the video response. So anyway, let's try and create a model for third month generation using this expansion for the cube of the E field. So we can assume that the frequency at omega b is three times the frequency at omega a. And furthermore, that the spatial frequency at three omega a is very close to three times the spatial frequency at omega a. So we're assuming that these two could be perfectly phase matched or even slightly phase mismatched, um, but all the other terms just drop out in the following way. Now note that it's very obvious that the a cube term here must survive because again, that's just tripling the omega one frequency, but this one will also survive because that starts at uh, omega b, which is now three omega a, and then it sort of subtracts two omega a the following way. So you can think about this term as taking omega a and then tripling it, but this one taking the tripled frequency and maybe uh, reducing it back to, to uh, omega a. Okay, so with that in mind, we get this expression right here, and of course we have to include the e a, the regular a term and the regular b term, because they will always be phase matched with themselves, but we can actually drop those out, because usually this spatial frequency contribution from the strength of the fields is actually quite, quite small. So with that in mind, we get this expression for the cube of the E field. If we then look at the 3 omega A contribution to that, that field, it's going to look like this essentially, whereas the omega A contribution is going to look like, like this. All right, so let's take a look at what happens if we substitute the 3 omega A part into the master equation. If we do that, we can use some of the same tricks as before with replacing the second gradient and canceling out these two terms right here and then rearranging to find this differential equation for the evolution of the um, component at 3 omega a. And of course we do the same thing for the omega a contribution in the following way. We can change the double gradient, we can cancel out these terms, and we can divide through in order to get this differential equation right here. And so if we write down the system of coupled differential equations, we can rewrite them a little bit more by simply introducing delta beta as the difference between these two spatial frequencies, giving us this set of differential equations. Okay, so what can we do with those? Well, it turns out that we can show a couple of interesting things about them. First of all, if we compute the intensity of these two fields and then take the derivative of them, we can see that they in total add up to zero, which is kind of nice because that essentially implies that these equations here conserve energy. And again, what we're trying to model here is just the transfer of power from omega a into three omega a. So it kind of makes sense that we wouldn't have any sort of loss of energy in that process, even if the power sort of goes back and forth a little bit. Furthermore, if we assume the limit where ea is way, way greater than the three omega a field, then we can basically recover the simple model that we got in the previous video. So it's kind of nice to, to see that it has this, um, has this property that you can reduce it to a, a simpler case in this limit. And finally, if we look at the exact case where, build, where delta beta is equal to zero, in other words, where the phase matching is perfect, we can actually solve this set of coupled differential equations analytically. Um, now, we're not going to do that in this video. Here we're just going to solve them numerically, but I've linked a series of videos in the description, which should hopefully explain this in a bit more detail. Okay, so let's take a look at those numerical solutions. First of all, um, I've written a short notebook in Python that is also linked in the description, which you can play around with in order to look at this yourself. But here we see the behavior if the phase mismatch is zero. So we can see the power very quickly gets transferred from the omega a field into the three omega a field, like so, and sort of saturates after a certain distance. But if we don't have a perfect phase mismatch, in fact, if it increases, you can see that this is no longer the case. So again, if we start at zero here and then increase a little bit, we can see power starts to get transferred back into the omega a field like so, and if we increase the spatial frequency mismatch, the power sort of wobbles back and forth. But also, if we increase the spatial frequency mismatch, you can see that the overall amplitude of the E3 field decreases quite significantly. It starts up by being like maybe 95% or something, but then as we increase this mismatch, it gets lower and lower and lower and lower, and it almost as if nothing's actually happening here. So basically, this is what I've been trying to explain with regards to phase matching, that if the spatial frequencies of the red field and the blue field here don't actually 
line up in a good way, then almost no power gets transferred from one into the other, and then we might as well ignore those terms in the in the first place. So anyway, let's try and summarize the results we've obtained so far. We have this master equation right here, and if we assume that the cube of the e-field can be expressed in the following way with two different terms, then we arrive at this expression for the cube of the entire e-field. And then using the concept of phase matching and sort of knowing what terms will drop out because of the refractive index and the frequency we're launching in, we can cancel out some of these terms and arrive at this model here for third harmonic generation, which again we could solve numerically. So anyway, I hope you found this video interesting. Feel free to check out some of my other ones right over here and stay tuned for more. Bye-bye.